Good morning. I, uh, it is uh, so good, and, and it's okay if you see movement happening right now. It's so good to be back uh, with the children and everything. It's just uh, really a blessing um, to be able to minister to them. And so right now they're moving uh, to uh, Kid City. They're, they're leaving right now, so, so no worries uh, about that. There's not like a mass exodus happening or anything like that <laughs> happening during the service. But um, anyways, man, I am so excited. Easter is three weeks away, and, and I hope that you guys are making plans to join us on that day. I mean, every day is a good day to celebrate and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Um, but if anyone ever needed a reason, right, there is not a more important uh, day in the life of the church than Resurrection Sunday. Um, as the Apostle Paul points out in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to paraphrase here, okay, but if, if Jesus Christ was not resurrected, then all of this would be absolutely pointless. And, uh, and so perhaps God has put someone in your life, perhaps God has put someone in your life uh, that is looking for a reason to come to church, um, that uh, is hoping to receive an invitation from someone, um, or maybe they're just praying for hope in some way, uh, something that seems to be a hopeless situation that God has placed them in your life and that you can invite them to New Bethel. And uh, so make plans. I, I want to encourage you. Make plans to meet them out front. Make plans. That you, you maybe go pick them up, um, whatever uh, it takes. But uh, obviously you want to get their permission before you put them in your car. Um, that's, it's, I know it sounds simple. It's just it's co common courtesy. Um, but, um, you know, be thinking about that coworker, that neighbor, that friend or family member that God wants you to invite and, and pray about making that a reality. Uh, today, we're going to be continuing our, our series called He Is. And uh, man, it has been great so far. Uh, we are excited to, to see, uh, you know, where we go next in this series. But, you know, we saw how Jesus comforted his disciples in the upper room last week, right? How he told them he's going to go and prepare a place for them. And uh, the same thing, the same promise is true for you and for me, that our Savior has gone to prepare a place for us. Uh, his Father's house has many rooms, right? And, uh, and so Jesus, he tells his disciples on that, on that night, as they're having their last uh, meal together before the crucifixion, before the uh, resurrection. And so he tells them he's going to go away. He never hid that fact from them, but it's becoming a little more real to them that he's going to go away. And, and of course, uh, he wants them to know that at that time, the time in which he has previously spoken, that time is coming near, and he wants them to know where he is going. And so if you remember last week, uh, you know, they're, they're asking Philip, asks, hey, where are you going? We don't know the way. We don't know where it is. We don't know any of that. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so because they knew him, they knew the way. And the same is true for us. The same is true for us. Because we know Jesus, that we know that our Father made a way for you and for me. He sent his one and only Son. And that because we know him, because we know Jesus Christ, not only do we know him, but we know the Father because we have seen him and that he uh, has made a way for us. We, we recognize at the same time that he reveals truth to us, right? That we definitely know the truth of God because we have seen the fullness of God in Jesus, in Jesus. And so because of all of that, because we know Jesus, we can now say that we know life. We know life. There is no life apart from Christ because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And we don't have to wander about aimlessly in this world. I think there are a lot of people that are wandering around wondering, hey, what's the point of this life? Where am I going? How am I going to get there? Is this all there is? There's confusion. There's uncertainty. And we have a way. Not just a way. We have the way. We have the truth. We have the life. And that makes all the difference. You know, I said before that my desire, my hope and my desire through this series is that we would see Jesus 
for how beautiful he is, how majestic he is, how glorious he is. Maybe, we're seeing, maybe some of you are seeing him for the first time, and maybe some of you are saying, man, this is, this is a lot more than I look. You know, the second glance, the third glance, the fourth glance uh, is different. And so uh, I would encourage you to, to just, uh, as we go through the rest of this series, you know, continue to dig in. Continue to lean in as these scriptures that are so familiar to us come alive again. Um, so let's be swept away by God today, right? Um, if you have your Bible with me, please turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to go to Mark chapter 14 today. Uh, the 14th chapter, Mark's in the New Testament. If you're looking through your Bible, it's in the New Testament, uh, you know, usually about two-thirds, maybe three-quarters of the way through. But, uh, you know, we're going to go to Mark chapter 14, and uh, we're going to begin in verse 32 this morning. Mark 14, 32. Please follow along as I read the word of God aloud. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. He went a little farther, fell to the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you stay awake one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once again, he went away and prayed, saying the same thing. And again, he came and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. They did not know what to say to him. Then he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The time has come. See, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. See, my betrayer is near. Thanks be to God for his word. Jesus and the disciples, they had been in the upper room, as we said, where they celebrated the Passover meal. Of course, Jesus had given them some final instructions. He told them that the Holy Spirit would come. He also spoke of the one who was to betray him. Judas Iscariot left right after that. And when the supper was over, after they had all eaten from the bread and drank from the cup, Jesus' body and his blood, it says that they sang a song together and went to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is pretty self-explanatory. It is a hillside that's filled with olive trees, a grove, if you will, that overlooked the city. Obviously, people didn't plant or harvest in the city, and so farmers and growers each had a plot on this hillside, a plot of land on the edge of the city that they could tend. And it's this area, this particular area happened to be filled with olive trees. Verse 32 says that they came to a place named Gethsemane. This was one specific place, one specific area on the Mount of Olives. It was a garden positioned in the midst of all of these olive trees where Jesus and his disciples, they had been before. We know that Jesus often, he liked to withdraw from the crowds and even the disciples sometimes to spend time with the other two persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Son. One might even say that he liked elevated positions, mountaintops, hillsides, perhaps to commune with his Father. 
But on this night, he and his disciples, they went for a walk after dinner to one of their favorite places. John says in his gospel that Jesus and his disciples had often met there, and Judas and his friends, they would know exactly where to find him because this was a place they were familiar with. So Jesus and the 11 disciples, they go to this garden, Gethsemane. This specific garden belonged to someone, but that person that it belonged to is not important. None of the gospel writers, they mention, none of them mention who owns this garden, but we know the name, Gethsemane. Gethsemane means olive press. They would grow olives nearby, and they would bring them here to Gethsemane to be turned into olive oil. The olives would be pressed, and the oil would be harvested. And in a similar fashion, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, would be under immense amounts of pressure and experience excruciating pain. This scene in the garden is so important to us because it gives us a more complete picture of who Jesus is. I mean, it's one thing to say he is the light of the world. It's one thing to say he's the bread of life, he's the good shepherd, he is living water, he is the alpha and the omega, the resurrection and the life. Yes, he is all of those things, and he is so many more things. But there is something important about this scene that we don't get in those descriptions. Frankly, there's something about this scene that makes us a little uncomfortable. We like Jesus. We like gardens. We don't like Jesus in this garden. Not this garden. And even though there are things that we would rather look away from, I'm going to ask that we look again, that we keep our eyes open to fix on this. The first thing we need to see today is that Jesus is troubled. He is troubled. Beginning in verse 32, it says, Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he told the disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. He went a little farther. He falls down to the ground. He prays. If it's possible, this hour would pass from him. I mean, they arrive at the garden. He's taken his three guys with him, the three guys that he spent the most time with, the closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. They seem to be the leaders, the inner circle, the ones he is closest to, and it says that he is feeling deeply distressed. He is deeply grieved. He is troubled. This is one of those cases where I'm not sure that the English language does justice to the situation. This phrase, deeply distressed and troubled, there there are two words in the Greek that are used to convey this thought. The first word is ekthombastai. The second is admonine. Now, admonine means to be filled with deep distress, deep distress and anguish, but ekthombastai means to be struck with terror. This is a terrible surprise. It is amazement. At how awful it is. Amazement in not a good way. What do we call that? We call that horror. Horror. This is what Jesus is feeling. He tells Peter, James, and John that he is deeply grieved to the point of death. How deep is that grief? The word is paralupos. This word that we get for perimeter or periphery. He is surrounded. He is engulfed. He is feeling the horror and the terror and the sorrow and the deep distress and the anguish. And it is surrounding him. He is closed in on all sides. It's all around. And he is overwhelmed with sorrow. 
he tells them, stay, stay where you are and keep watch. Stay awake, keep your eyes open. I mean, he's still teaching them. He's still teaching them. Even in this moment, he's teaching them. There are things that they still need to learn. Keep your eyes open. I don't want you to miss this. Don't miss this. Keep your eyes open. I need you to see what happens here. And he says the same to us today. Jesus, he goes about a stone's throw away, and he just collapses under the weight. He falls to the ground. He's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. What is it that has terrified him so much? I mean, he obviously knew that this was coming, right? He knows everything. I mean, how is it that he's shocked or surprised? How is that possible? I mean, he knew what was going to happen. He's fully man, he's fully God. He knew that he was going to die, and he knew the manner in which it was all going to take place. He had prophesied about it. He wanted the disciples to know about it. He even told the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day that he, he was the temple, right? The temple is going to be destroyed and rebuilt in three days. However, as many have pointed out, it is one thing to know something in your head. It's one thing to know something cognitively in the abstract, and it's another thing to know it experientially. To know something with your whole being. As Pastor Tim Keller writes, he says, we may know in our minds that the experience in the dentist chair will hurt, but we make the appointment and we jump into the chair with a nervous joke, but as soon as the drilling begins... We say to ourselves, if I had known it was going to be like this, I would have never come. It's not worth it. Now, what if I somehow, you know, what if, what if somehow I knew, what if somehow you knew while you were sitting at home deciding whether or not to schedule the appointment, what if you knew for just a minute, just a minute or two, what if you had a foretaste of what that actual pain would feel like? If you felt it, if you saw it, if you experienced it right there in that minute before you got there. If that were possible, as Tim Keller says, most of the world's dentists would be out of business. See, it wasn't the betrayal of Judas one of his beloved disciples. It wasn't the coming arrest, the joke of a trial, the mocking, the beating, the scourging. It wasn't the upcoming crucifixion or the death that awaited him that had him so terrified. Those things are terrible and painful, but that isn't what caused this pain. That isn't what this was about. The amount of agony It was the anticipation of taking on the sin of the world and experiencing the wrath, the separation of God. Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God, was about to experience something he had never experienced before, something that he knew not, sin. Sin. And with that sin would come separation. He had never been marred by such a thing. He was the perfect, spotless lamb without blemish, and he was about to be filled with it. The sins of the whole world. 2 Corinthians 5 says that God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. No one has ever loved like this, and no one ever will. The famous preacher Jonathan Edwards once said in one of his sermons, he says, the agony of Jesus Christ was caused by a vivid, bright, full, immediate view of the wrath of God God the Father, as it were, set the cup down before him, which was vastly more terrible than Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. 
how he, he now had a near view of the furnace into which he was about to be cast. He stood and he viewed the raging flames and the glowing of its heat that he might know where he was going and what he was about to suffer. God brought him and he sat him at the mouth of the furnace that he might look in and stand and view its fierce and raging flames and might see where he was going and might voluntarily, don't miss that part, might voluntarily enter into it and bear it for us knowing exactly what it was. It wasn't that these things happened to him. It's that he did it of his own volition. Jesus saw what was coming and it took his breath away. For a short time there in the garden, he felt what he had never felt before, sin. And not just the sin of one person. No, it was the sin of the whole world. Your sin, my sin, the sins of the whole world. Even a little sin would have a profound effect on someone so holy, so other than this place. Now multiply it by all of the sin, all of the evil, all of the badness that would ever exist in the world, and it would be put, past, present, and future, it would be put on the one who is truly good. He's in agony. He's in pain. The hurt, the sorrow, he is face down on the ground, practically paralyzed. And to think that I contributed to that. My sin. There. Your sin. Our sin had this kind of effect on the Son of God. Our sin would cause division, would cause separation between the Father and the Son. So we must ask ourselves the question, what do we think of sin? What is our response to our sin? That's Jesus' response to our sin. What is ours? Maybe I should take my sin a little more seriously. I mean, quite frankly, sin should trouble us. Separation from God should crush us. Instead, we usually say things like, well, nobody's perfect. We dismiss it. We say, well, only God can judge me. Sometimes we even chalk it up and we say, well, I'm just sowing my wild oats. It's understandable. Everybody does it. And yet our king is face down in the garden because of it. It should break our hearts. It should break the hearts of the disciples too, but they're already asleep. The one, the one without sin, hear this, the one without sin, the prince of peace, is wrestling and writhing on the ground while those who are with sin are resting peacefully. The one without sin and the one with sin. No peace. Peace. How does Jesus respond in this moment? I don't think that any of us have ever felt this and we never will. Praise God. But how did Jesus respond in that moment? He prays. He goes to the one who can do something about it. The next thing we need to see is that Jesus is prayerful. He is prayerful in this moment. Verse 35, he went a little farther. He falls down to the ground and he prays that if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and he found them sleeping. He says to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you stay awake one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
See here how Jesus responds when he is overwhelmed. How do we respond when we're overwhelmed? How does Jesus respond when he's overwhelmed? What does Jesus do when he is the saddest he has ever been? He's modeling for us. He's showing us. What does he do when he's at his lowest point? He prays. He prays. His response on this dark night is to pray. And he wants his disciples to see this, and he wants them to know this, and he wants us to see this, and he wants us to know this, that our response and his response, when we are in our darkest night, our response should be the same. If Jesus, the one who is fully God, the one who was there at the creation of the world, the one who regularly does miracles, that Jesus, if his response is prayer, then shouldn't ours be the same thing? If he is so troubled that he must pray, he can't not pray, then shouldn't we be on our knees a little more? Charles Spurgeon, he says this, he says, leaving all his disciples and going away alone, Jesus prayed and wrestled with God, and in our time of trouble, our resort must be to prayer. Restrain not prayer at any time, even when the sun shines brightly upon you, but be sure to pray. Be sure that you pray when the midnight darkness surrounds your spirit. Notice what Jesus says here. He cries out, Abba, Father. Abba is this intimate term for what a child calls their father. They don't say father. No, they say daddy. They say daddy. They cry out. Like crying out in the middle of the night. Daddy. Jesus' identity is found His identity is found in his relationship to his father. Much like this child calling out for help, Jesus, fully man, fully God, knows exactly where his help is coming from. And so he calls out, Daddy! There's a battle raging here in the garden. This is the most difficult thing that Jesus has ever had to face. Certainly, Jesus is facing in this moment is more difficult than anything we will ever face. And the Father has shown him the cup. It's not a physical cup. It's not something he's holding, but it is just as real. Throughout the Old Testament, the cup was a picture, a picture of the wrath and the judgment of God. And here it is before Jesus, and he has a choice to make. He has a choice to make. Will he drink from that cup? He sees what it looks like. He smells it. It's bitter. And he says, Abba, Father, everything's possible for you. I know that you can do anything. Take it from me. Take this cup from me. But, but God, if you can't, if you won't, Your will be done. Not mine, but yours. Daddy, I know that you can do this. But it's okay if you can't. I'll do it. Is there any way possible that you can accomplish this without me doing this? Either way, your plans and purposes are greater for me. I'm going to do it. This battle is raging in the garden. And the scene is the, some call it the final temptation of Jesus. You remember that the, the Holy Spirit had tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Early in his ministry, Jesus had been tempted. He had gone out in the wilderness for for 40 days, and there he was tempted by Satan. For 40 days, he didn't eat. He fasted, he prayed, and it was there that he was tempted. You think the devil didn't 
make an appearance here in the garden? I mean, we can't know for sure, but I I would say so. If Satan can stop Jesus from going to the cross, then the great rescue plan is stopped. That's it. It's over. Operation Save the World called off. And so Jesus, he predicts his death in Matthew 16. I mean, look back to that for a second. He predicts his death in Matthew 16, right? And Peter says, never, Lord, that's not going to happen to you. No, we'll never let that happen. And what does he say? He says, get behind me, Satan. Get out of my way. I got to do this. I got to do it. And so here in the garden, you can bet, you can bet the devil is there whispering in his ear, you don't deserve this. You're holy. Those sinners, they deserve death. Not you. They deserve this wrath. Not you. How is this fair to you? This isn't fair. You haven't done anything wrong. Notice here that this is the opposite of what Satan says to us. Whereas he says to Jesus, you don't deserve these bad things. It's the opposite for us. Satan says things to us like, you don't deserve God's love. You're terrible. You're the worst. If people knew what you're really like, then they wouldn't like you either. I bet God is ashamed of you. Pastor John MacArthur, he says, this is the last thing that Satan wants. He wants to keep him from the cross. In his first temptation, he offered him everything he deserved without the cross. Peter, he's like, it's an outrage to think of you going to the cross and dying. And here in the garden, Satan shows up again. Satan's hope is to drive Jesus to the Father and say, I can't do it. I can't do it. And if Satan succeeds in that, then hell is the only place where people will ever live forever. Heaven will be empty. God's word will be untrue. The promise of salvation, a lie, and Satan is really the sovereign. This is the great battle. My friends, the closer that you get to God, the closer that we get to God, the more temptation that we will experience. Jesus himself, he experienced temptation, and he is God. Many think that, many many have this idea that, man, the closer that you get to God, then the more free you are from temptation. But that's a lie. It's a lie. Satan wants you to believe that. I mean, some even say, well, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. (laughs) It's not. People die at the center of God's will. People die there for their faith at the center of God's will. The center of God's will is the best place to be. (laughs) But if you're looking for safe, (laughs) go somewhere else. The closer you get to God, the bigger target on you for Satan, the greater impact for such a godly person to fall. And we have seen many a godly person fall. And so as you get closer to God, the more temptation you're going to deal with, the closer you get to obedience, the more opposition, the closer that you get to spiritual health, the more pushback you're going to see. And at the same time, the more prayer that you need. But then again, you know you need prayer. And here in the garden, darkness is coming. Jesus knows it and he's praying and he instructs Peter, hey, stay awake, stay awake, pray that you're not gonna enter into temptation. You know, the spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. I mean, this is how Jesus fights his battles and it is how we are to fight ours. We fight our battles through prayer. Prayer is a weapon. It is an offensive weapon. It is how we do offense. It should be a first priority and not a last resort. And all too often, we are accustomed to taking things in our own hands, aren't we? I'm just going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'm going to dig my heels in. We got phrases for stuff. We believe that if we just work a little harder, we can make it happen. 
We can do it on our own. I can clean myself up. I can pull myself out of the gutter. We can turn things around. And yet that is the opposite of trusting the Lord. More often, when we do that, when we get involved, we just end up getting in the Lord's way. The battle belongs to the Lord. Our weapon is prayer. And just as God told the Israelites all the way back in Exodus, he says the same to you, the Lord will fight for you. And you must be quiet. That's a nice way of saying it. Be quiet. The Lord is going to fight for you. Does the Lord fight for me? Yeah, look at Gethsemane. He does. The last thing we need to see today is that Jesus is yielded to the will of the Father. He is yielded. Look at verse 36. He cries out, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. This cup, take it away from me, but nevertheless, not what you will, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus has never wavered on this, on this fact that he does what God tells him to do. He says that he, he, he says what the Father says, uh, what the Father tells him to say. He says what the Father tells him to do. He does. He tells this to the disciples time and time again. He was sent for the very purpose to do the will of the Father. When he taught his disciples to pray, what's he say? He tells them, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' life, the will of the Father trumps all. Your will be done. Your will be done, God. Although he himself is fully God, he submits to the work of the Father, to the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit. There is love and mutual submission and such unity in that trinity. But this is what a heart yielded to God looks like. Regardless of his feelings, he's obedient. Although it may not sound great, although it may not be something he's excited about, although it may be painful, although it may cause personal suffering, he is going to consider others better than himself and the will of the Father above all. So Jesus responds to God, Whatever you want, God, I'll do it. He will drink every last drop of this cup of wrath, this cup of bitterness, this cup of separation, this cup of sin for the sake of those three guys sleeping stones throw away from him for the sake of the other nine, yes, including Judas. Because of the numerous followers, and yes, because one day you and I would need a savior. And so because of all of that, he will drink every last drop. If he doesn't drink it, then they're going to have to. If he doesn't drink it, somebody's got to drink it. He'll do it. He will drink all of the cup and endure whatever comes his way because he knows that for your sake and for mine, we will not have heaven. We will not have life. We will not have a relationship with him. And most of all, because God told him to. What would it take for you and I to say the same thing? To have the same attitude. Your will, God. Your will be done in my life. Your will be done in my family, in my home. Your will be done. Not mine. Forget my plans. Forget, forget my dreams. I'm going to seek yours. 
and I'm going to do yours. It's your kingdom, God. It's not mine. It's not my kingdom. Ask yourselves this question. If all of my prayers, if all of my prayers were answered in exactly the way I wanted them to be, whose will would be done? Who would benefit from such petitions to God? Him or me? Is your heart so yielded to God that in all things you might declare, not my will, God, but yours be done? Let's pray. God, we give you thanks. Such, such extravagant love, God that you show us. God, you didn't just show us how to live, how to surrender, how to be obedient, but God, you actually did. You did it for our sake. And so God, I pray today, I pray today for those who are listening to you who have never heard this message of salvation. The word that you have for them today is that they can be saved because of your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that they would not linger, that they would not stretch it out any longer than it has to be. I pray that they would seek you and they would find you today. Because of your great love, we can experience peace where you experienced wrath, where you experienced unrest. We can experience love and peace and joy. God, I'm not sure we will ever understand, we will ever fully grasp that, that trade that exchange, your life for mine. But God, we thank you. The greatest love this world has ever known. And so God, for those who are hearing this and, and they would say, yes, I'm found in you. I am already one who is follower of you who has been saved by you, who has been rescued by you. God, I pray that they would be strengthened, that their faith would be strong, that they might be obedient to you. For God, in that moment, you showed your love for all people. So God, I pray for obedience, for some to go to maybe they're being called today to go around the world with the gospel in hand. Maybe they're being called to go next door to a neighbor or friend. But whatever it is, God, that you have, whatever will you have for each of us, God, I pray that we would be obedient, that we would do your will, that we would endure whatever pain may come. With you, God, we can endure anything. Help us to yield our hearts and our lives to you In Jesus' name we pray.